I am Daniel White III, president of GLM Omnimedia Group, and this is the Get Things Done podcast, episode number 19. The simple purpose of this podcast is to help you get things done every day of your life so that you can accomplish something worthwhile with your life. I am a firm believer that God has put each person on earth to do something great for His glory. In this podcast, we are going through the book, Doing It Now, by Edwin C. Bliss. I had just finished speaking at a meeting in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, many years ago. And as I was walking through the airport, as was my custom, I stopped in a little bookstore. Back in those days, I just loved bookstores and libraries. Now I love my Kindle. Be that as it may, I picked up this little yellow book, and read it in its entirety. It is one of the best books that I have ever read on the subject of productivity, getting things done, and avoiding procrastination. And along with prayer and the power of God in my life, through Jesus Christ, it is one of the reasons why I have accomplished so much with my life in such a short time. Today I will continue sharing with you some of the principles that Edwin C. Bliss uh, talks about in his book. As we begin, beloved, let me give you this reminder from the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 7 and 8 says, With good will, doing service as to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord. Our quote for today is from Dale Carnegie. He said, Inaction breeds doubt and fear. Action breeds confidence and courage. If you want to conquer fear, Do not sit home and think about it. Go out and get busy. Today in the Get Things Done podcast, we are continuing with part three of our series titled Overcoming Fear of Failure. And I want to remind you to take advantage of our special offer, If you enjoy this podcast, please feel free to purchase a copy of the book, Doing It Now, a 12-step program for curing procrastination and achieving your goals. It is available on our website for just $10. In our last episode, we talked about how successes tend to occur in fixed proportions to attempts. The more often you try and the more failures you chalk up, the more successes you have. Thus, if we want more success, we must simply make more attempts at doing things. We must make a pile of chips. Today we are going to consider how we can overcome the vague dread of failure. Sometimes dealing with fear of failure isn't as simple as just forcing yourself to make chips. Sometimes a vague dread of what might happen causes you to keep putting off the desired action. How do you deal with that? That term vague dread holds the clue. As long as your fears are vague and undefined, 
they are impossible to deal with. So the first step is to make them specific, concrete, identifiable, pin down exactly what it is you're afraid of. Uh, this is another application of pigeonholing. The point is that it's difficult to deal with something that's hazy and uh, general. Whether you're talking about fear, procrastination, or any other problem, if you go for a medical checkup and announce that you don't feel well, you aren't given a prescription. Instead, the doctor begins to probe for more specifics until a precise label can be attached to your ailment. It's pointless even to think about remedies. Although in this case we've already identified the ailment and labeled it, the label is fear, fear of failure. But you must push beyond that. It's still too general, still too vague. Exactly why do you fear failure in this particular case? As you dig deeper, you may realize, for example, that what you truly, really dread is the embarrassment that would result from that failure. You would have to admit to your associates that you bombed, and that's what's really bothering you. Now, you have put your problem into a pigeonhole, labeled embarrassment before associates. You still haven't solved your problem, but you have at least isolated it. Now, instead of trying to deal with a generality, fear of failure, you are dealing with a specific, your embarrassment when your associates would become aware of that failure. Now, you can ask yourself some pertinent questions such as, would my failure really be a big deal with my co-workers? Would they really care that much? What difference does it really make how they feel? What specific action might they take as a result of my failure? And how serious would that be? Suppose they ridicule me. I wouldn't like it, but what harm would be done? And in case I am openly criticized for my failure, what would be my best response? What about the other side of the coin? Wouldn't at least some people admire me for sticking my neck out, even if they didn't say so? And if I do fail, what lessons will I have learned? Putting my failure aside for a moment, what are my chances of success? Am I worrying too much about potential embarrassment, which isn't all that likely anyway? What about the respect I may earn from those same associates if I succeed? And aside from all that, am I giving too much consideration to the question of what other people will think. What about my own feelings? Win, lose, or draw? Am I not likely to respect myself more knowing that I had the guts to stick my neck out and risk embarrassment for a worthwhile objective? How will I feel about myself if I don't have the courage at least to give it a whirl, to give it a try? It's decision time. So am I going to do it or not? What's the first step? What am I waiting for? Note that these questions won't even be asked unless you first have clarified precisely what it is that you're afraid of. Elementary, as this sounds, most people simply don't take the trouble. 
in business management. We see this blunder every day. A problem is presented in a staff meeting, and people immediately begin to suggest solutions when the discussion would be far more fruitful if they were to forget about solutions for the time being and probe more deeply into what the problem really is, as distinguished from what it it appears to be. But suppose all your probing still leaves you uncertain as to how to proceed. You understand the problem, and you understand your fears, but they are still there. You can't wish them away. What do you do? When you can't diminish your fears simply by analyzing them, and believe me, you can do so more often than you would expect, the next step is to ask yourself how you would proceed if you weren't afraid, and then act in precisely that way. This has been called the Turin Method, named after the great 17th century French Marshal General Henry de Turin. He did the same thing that countless other courageous people have done throughout the ages, but it has become associated with his name. Many times during the Thirty Years' War, Turin led his army successfully against superior forces, marching boldly into combat at the head of the attacking unit. Unit, rather, when someone once praised him for his courage, he replied, "Of course, I conduct myself like a brave man, but all the time, I'm feeling afraid. Naturally, I don't." give in to the fear, but say to my body, tremble, old carcass, but walk, and my body walks. That's the ultimate answer to fear. Don't try to deny its existence. You can't fool yourself into thinking you're not afraid or anxious, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. Anyway, Acknowledge the fear, but then act as if it didn't exist. Now, let's pray our prayer together that we pray every week. And one of the reasons why we pray this prayer each week is because of the line that says, We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. So let's pray together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises. Declare unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name, amen. Now, dear friend, the greatest secret to getting things done with your life for the glory of God is to have the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. When you have the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, you can say with Paul in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior yet, here is how. First, dear friend, accept the fact that you are a sinner 
and that you have broken God's law. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Second, accept the fact that there is a penalty for sin. The Bible states in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. Third, accept the fact that you are on the road to hell. Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew 10.28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Also, the Bible says in Revelation 21, 8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now this is bad news, but here's the good news. Jesus Christ said in John 3.16 himself, For God so loved the world, if you're in this world, God loves you, that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, he was speaking of himself, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, dear friend, just believe in your heart right now that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose from the dead by the power of God for you, so that you can live uh, forever with him. Pray and ask him to come into your heart today to save your soul, and he will. He will save you. Romans 10, 9 through 13 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Until next time, my beloved, may God bless you and keep you. And remember, if you have something to do, there is no better time to do it than now. God bless you.